talk about Mike Loxley. Mike Loxley, the, the current Maryland coach, has started the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches. It says the group will help identify and groom minority college and professional coaches, as well as develop a list of candidates that should be considered for future job openings. There are 14 black head coaches in FBS out of 130 jobs. There are three black head coaches in the NFL. Um, He said, when I took the Maryland job last year and looked at the landscape of college football, I thought to myself, there is something missing. I'm on the back nine of my career, and the pathway to becoming a head coach is still as difficult as when I got into the business in 1992. Uh, He said, I wanted to create an organization that would be able to help prepare, promote, and produce the next group of coaches coming up through the ranks at every level. There's an 11-person board of directors that is going to be charged with vetting and maintaining a qualified list of candidates. Uh, And the board of directors includes Ozzie Newsom, who is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, College Football Hall of Fame. He was the first ever black general manager in the NFL. Of course, he was the former GM of the Ravens. It's got Nick Saban on there. It's got Bill Polian, who's a former GM of the, I mean, the Bills, the Panthers, and the Colts. Mike Tomlin, current Steelers coach. Doug Williams, former Washington quarterback and a Super Bowl MVP. And then you got a bunch of other guys, right? The Dolphins general manager, Chris Greer. Uh, Willie Jeffries, who's a college football Hall of Fame coach, first black coach in Division I history. Uh, South Carolina State's coach, Oliver Pugh. Uh, Rick Smith, the former Texans general manager. And uh, several other people, right? So, that list of people is, is fine, but Chris and I, when we were discussing earlier... It's a little weird to have active coaches on this list, right? Yeah. Or even active I just GMs. don't understand how how Nick Saban is supposed to be grooming black coaches for head coaching jobs when it's his responsibility to put together the best staff he can put together. Yeah, for for his own program. For his own program. And and same could be said for Chris Greer, the Dolphins general manager, um Mike Tomlin. See now the you know? like GMs and stuff, that's decision makers. Okay? Agreed, but it's decision makers that are that are active, that yeah. can help hire for their own team. So you know, and and Saban, of course, he's a decision maker for because Saban's basically the GM of Alabama's program. You know, I, Tomlin, kind of the same thing. He can hire and fire coaches. Um, I, I just I think it's a little strange to have, you know, it, one of the others, Desiree Reed Francois, is UNLV's athletic director. Uh, was the first Hispanic athletic director for an FBS school. Well, she's the current athletic director, so she can hire and fire as well. So the, the way to the way to fix this problem is we have to be able to get these guys better coordinator jobs because that's where the head coaching jobs pull from. Okay, rarely are you finding a head coach come from a position coach. Rarely, and when they do get those jobs, they are usually really bad jobs. Okay. Yeah, Terry said. Ole Miss, Ole Miss hired an interim coach from the offensive line when they got rid of Hugh Freeze and they wanted an Ole Miss man, and he was pretty much the placeholder while they went through their their NCAA penalties. And then once the penalties were up, he's out. You know, yeah. um, every now and then you you find a team just in desperate need of somebody cheap, and they'll go get a positions coach guy. But the way this is fixed is we have to get more black coaches at coordinator positions. And so if you, I literally just listened to this today. Um, our guys at West lot break down the whole big 10 and, and they just did their Purdue breakdown and Purdue. I, I don't mean to like randomly crap on this guy, but Bob Diaco is, is their defensive coordinator that they just hired. Okay. All right. Bob Diaco was a great DC at Notre Dame where it was loaded with talent. Then he was a complete whiff and bust at Cincinnati or at uh, at UConn yeah, for two as a, years as a head coach. Yeah, and then and then a complete waste of space at Nebraska, a complete waste of space at Oklahoma. Then he went to Louisiana Tech for like all these are one year jobs, and yeah. then he does, gets fired and he gets fired and he gets fired because the they just they're just not or he moves on to another job because he's not good at the job he's at, and and Purdue hired him. Now now I'm not I'm not necessarily just crapping on this guy. But there had to be a black defensive coordinator somewhere out there that's got a better resume than this. And if you're pointing to seven years ago at Notre Dame, he was really good, and maybe he can turn the Purdue Boilermakers into something special like he did at Notre Dame seven years ago, 
then that, I think that's a bridge too far. So at some point in time, I don't know, I don't know how he got interviewed. I don't know his connection to Braun. I really like Purdue, not crapping on that program, but this is the issue is, is failed white coaches keep getting jobs over and over and over again. Yeah. And black coaches usually get one or two chances and then they never get another shot and they just go back to position coaches and that's it. We gotta, we gotta give them the same runway that we would give anybody else. And they got to get the opportunities at DCs and OCs because that's where the head coaching jobs are coming from. Well, a lot of this is basically they have to be able to infiltrate that the the quote unquote good old boy network, right? Yep. Which is what all of this stems down to is it, these people hire people that they are comfortable with, and yes. they don't go and yeah. The brown yeti jumps in and said a lot of it is uh, who you know. That's 100% what it is. Uh, Joseph Gomez jumps in. He said Raiders defensive end Max Crosby, Jets wide receiver, uh, uh, never mind, jo- Josh Dotson, Bills cornerback Trey, uh, Trey Davius have all opted out of the season due to COVID. We'll, we'll get into that once we get a, a full finalized list. Uh, Terry said, shouldn't the GMs already have this list for when they need coaches? And then uh, the Brown Yeti said, maybe Nick is done after this year. Um, maybe. I mean, if he wins a national championship, maybe he decides to hang it up, but who knows? Um, but yeah, and, and, and a lot and of this now, is, now, is so. Let me tell you, like the story and the history. This is one of the reasons why I know that I'm gonna catch crap for this. One of the reasons why I'm a big Bill Belichick guy. Okay, Ozzie Newsom was a aging tight end for the Browns when Bill got there. Okay, and Bill realized this guy's loved in Cleveland. Loved in Cleveland. Can't can't kick him off the team, but he can't play no more. And so Bill called him and said, "Hey, why don't you come help me scout?" Why don't, you, why don't you pair up with me and, and do some GM work, okay? And Bill taught him to be a general manager his entire career in Cleveland. Didn't last too long, but he was there for a couple of years. Made the playoffs a couple of years. When Art Modell decided to sell the team, not sell the team, move the team to Baltimore, he took one person from Cleveland with him. That was Ozzie. Yeah. And, and that was one of those things where a coach – who had the influence, who had the the decision making ability, said, I gotta take this guy and I gotta find a home for him. But because I can't let him on the field anymore, he's gonna hurt my football team. But he has too much clout in the locker room. And I need him around. And the city loves him. They'll they'll run me out on a rail. And and this was young Bill Belichick who realized he still had to appease people before he had all the rings and now he can do whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> and and so he promoted Ozzy up into the front office and those guys Ozzie learned to do that job, and as much as I hated the Ravens during his run, he's a hell of a GM. Oh, yeah. He knew how to build a team, and he knew how to build a team on a budget, okay? They, they didn't have a lot of crazy star players. This guy was an offensive guy, and he realized defense wins titles. Bill taught me that, you yeah. know? And what did he do in Baltimore? He built on the defensive side of the ball. And, and that's just one of those things where somebody got an opportunity, Okay. They learned the job. They, they weren't an expert in the job when they got the job, but they learned the job, They're capable of learning. Give them the chance. Well, and see, that's a lot of that is, you know, Bowling Green. We can take Bowling Green, just a G5 school from the MAC, for an example. They hire Scott Leffler. Scott Leffler ends up hiring Brian Van Gordon as his, de- as his defensive coordinator. It, neither one of those guys was qualified for those jobs at this point. I mean, it, yeah. it was just completely ridiculous, and yet. Here we are. And and Bowling Green was so incredibly successful under a minority coach, Dino Babers, and they haven't gone back that direction. And you have to assume it's just based on, okay, we're going to go with guys that we know, or yeah. or is it we're going to go with guys that can't get jobs anywhere else and we know they're going to stay here. It's, well, so the it's, prop, that, now, that's another issue with the smaller schools. So when you're yeah. looking at those little schools, th- those guys are, are looking for things different than the big boy schools, okay? The Power Five are looking for, I mean, they would, re- most Power Fives, now every now and then you get your Jeff Brahms, every now and then you get your P.J. Flex that come from your smaller schools and they've got a new innovative way of doing something and they come up through the ranks and then they just impress people. But a lot of Power Five jobs come from Power Five OCs in yes. DCs. And and that's that's just where the where the money's made and that's where it is. In in the NFL it's it's the same thing. I'm a big fan of Byron Leftwich. Okay. Love love that Bruce Arians hired him. It's one of the reasons I wanted Bruce in Cleveland so bad is is 
I think Byron's going to get the call any day now to be a head coach because the NFL is making this push and his offenses have been really good learning under Bruce. At some point in time, we also need to worry about, are we taking guys too soon? And are they going to just places where they have no chance of winning? All right. Yeah. Steve Wilkes went to Arizona for one year. He was a lame duck coach in a complete rebuild and was given no chance to actually rebuild that team. Now those, that record's on his resume for the rest of his life. Todd Bowles was given what two, three years in New York yeah, for three the Jets, years, I believe. Yeah. And and then and then will he ever get another shot? I don't know. But nobody could have won in the Jets. God of football himself, Bill Belichick, couldn't have won in the Jets. What's, what that, what you're the talking GM about? That ran is... that program was a complete idiot. What you're talking about is exactly what Mike Loxley was. He was at yeah. Maryland as an OC, took the New Mexico job. He went three and thirty-one or whatever That's over right. three and seasons. That's right. And no, and people hold that resume up and yeah. say, "Look how terrible Look the coach he was. Why should we ever give him another chance?" But he was at New Mexico, and that's I, I so agree. That's the so he I he agree. takes he takes an analyst job at Alabama. Nick Saban ends up promoting him all the way up to he was an on-field coach, and then he was the OC. He had a ridiculous 7.76 yards per play average the year that he was the OC. Gets the Maryland job, and no, he wasn't successful last year, but good gracious, he's in the Big Ten East. You know, yeah. so he they're going to give him time. Hey, hey, he went down and he beat Texas. That is true. Uh, they're they're going to give him time to be able to uh, get that thing done. Well, I don't think he beat Texas. Texas was two years ago, but yeah. That's that's the thing. Um, well, they beat Texas two years in a row. Well, yeah, but that was, those, that I was, think his first year he beat Texas. No, that was that was what was last year's first year. Last year was his first year. So yeah, because he, he was two years. he was the OC the year that uh, that Tua was. Uh, oh, that's I right. Guess, yeah, yeah, all yeah. Year so last year was his first year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, Terry Brewer jumps in. He said Lane Kiffin is a prime example. Got to love that empty trophy case. Uh, love that Tosh Point oh skit about him. Uh, Matt MS69 said it's pretty simple. White people know more white people. Black people know more black people. Most GMs are white. Most owners are white. Uh, Damien jumps in. He said, what's up? Good to see you, Damien. Huey said, we all know Ray Lewis shot that guy. <laughs> I swear to God. Uh, now, listen, when you want to have a podcast on Ray Lewis, be my guest. Let's talk. I'll do it. Uh, Terry said, get all the coaches together. Let the murder hornets loose. And the ones that are left after 30 minutes are now the head coaches. Uh, Robert Stagg. So this was my problem, and this was my fear with Brian Flores. We assumed that we assumed that the Dolphins were tanking last year. Okay, they dumped all their good players. Let's say Brian Flores and the Dolphins this year don't have a great year. Okay, and then let's say to never really gets healthy. They can't figure the quarterback position out. Year three, they're not good. At some point in time, somebody's going to give his whole resume his whole resume and say, look how terrible of a coach this guy was. When year one, you dumped every player he had for assets, and then he doesn't get to pick the assets. Yeah. Yeah. But right. we're going to use that year that they tanked, all right, that they threw in the towel for almost every game, and his players still played hard. He tried to win. He just wasn't given any talent to win, okay? Yeah. And no, I'm with you. And, and, and at the end of the day, his record is going to look really bad. And it's not, he didn't, he didn't draft Tua. He didn't put, he, he didn't want to tank. Like if, if, if those draft assets don't work out, Brian Flores is going to be responsible for it. He's going to be the one to bear the burden of it. And, and that's it. And the chances of him getting another job are slim. Robert Staggs jumps in on YouTube. He said, have you have you never met someone you hated just immediately that you didn't need to see them again to hate them? I'm not sure what that has to do with. I wonder if that's about. us. Maybe so. I don't know. Robert, if we uh, if we look like. I mean, that could be. Me. I'm sure a lot of people have that feeling about me. <laughs> I'm, I'm 100 percent certain. Of that. Uh, who knows? Who knows? I ain't that worried about it. Uh, if hey, if you hate us now, I mean, just wait till football season. Just wait. Uh, Matt said, Bowles got four years. Also, the problem with promotion sometimes is you promote someone until they are promoted into incompetence. Yeah, that's, that's entirely uh, possible. No, I do agree with that philosophy. of I see that in business. Every, I saw it when I was in the corporate world, and I had to get out. I just had to get out. Uh, and then he said, I guess all coaches are going to be praying mantises. Uh, talking about the murder hornet stuff. Huey jumps in. He said, uh, suck teams never give a chance to allow a coach's system to take full effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's 100% true. Well, that's what's happened in Cleveland. It's not just a coach's system. They change the general manager every year and a half, too. So one guy comes in with a plan. 
He starts that plan, and then midway through the plan, we fire that guy. Somebody else comes in, throws that whole plan away, new plan. And therein lies the problem of you've got, even if it doesn't work, you still have to let somebody complete a plan before you can say, oh, I like this new guy's plan better than yours. I'm firing you, and we're going to bring him in. Because yeah. there's always going to be somebody out there selling you a new plan. Uh, you, everybody that is in a position of leadership has to learn patience. 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 Yes. Terry, uh, Terry said, but isn't Cleveland supposed to be good this year? Ha, 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 ha. Uh, <laughs> Michael Fritz said, if, uh, if someone hates y'all, then there is something wrong with them. We appreciate nah, that. I'm okay with I, I get it. I, I fully get it. I we, know me. Yeah, I we, get it. we love it. We love it. Yeti 304 said, what's up, guys? Good to see Yeti in here. Uh, Matt MS69 said, I think in the NFL, a minimum of three years is needed. I think, I think college is four. I agree with that. Um, and then Joseph Gomez said, yes, the Browns are a perfect example. Yeah, 100%. So, so getting back to the main point here, this organization, this group that they are creating, that Loxley is creating, is an incredibly good idea, and yes. it should have been started a long time ago. Um, the guys that he has on the board here, fantastic. All incredibly well credentialed, all people that should be in a position to do something about this. The only question that we've got is, is it kind of weird having active coaches? Because if that's the case, and and you and I have talked about this before, if there is, uh, if you see a short in the market, and people don't want to hire these guys for whatever reason, uh, then you will see Mike Loxley and Nick Saban and Mike Tomlin and Chris Greer, etc. Take advantage of the market inefficiency. So here's the other thing that you got to worry about too. If if you're a, a minority coach, if you're a black coach or or, or, or a female coach or, or whatever trying to get into the game, and this committee doesn't give you a nod, are you are you blackballed out of it? Or do you just have no chance if for some reason you have been one of the guys to 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 cross Bill Polian in the past or or to cross Loxley or to cross Saban, are you just you just got no prayer? Well, the, the you just thing, got no chance. The good thing about this this group is that this is not the group that makes final decisions. So where we talked about that the good old boy network, uh, it still works both ways. So if you are friends with somebody and somebody wants to hire you, you but are I'm just probably saying, these guys are here job. to promote the minorities that are in their eyes qualified. But what if you're not qualified in their eyes, but you're qualified? Yeah, now that that could be there and lie, there and lies the issue of this is just my fear for things like that. I appreciate what they're doing, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's a positive thing. My fear for this is this is just another network, though. Yeah, no, you're and you're if right. you're not in this network, you might be in trouble. Well, how is it any different than the other network? No, you you've got a a very valid point there, uh, Terry. Terry jumps in. He said, "Hell, no wonder we can't find Yetis in the world. They're all on here. How many have we got now?" Have we just got two? We just got two in here. Uh, Robert Stagg said, no, it has to do with Justin Fields in Michigan. Sorry, wrote while watching the beginning of the show. I don't hate you guys. I'm just a little behind. <laughs> no worries. Well, hang around for football season. You'll find some reason to hate us, I promise. I promise. Yeah. All right, let's close out the show with this one. Very quick tidbit of news.